All right, so uh, today is the uh, 29th of January, and this is the fifth lecture of part two of um, Moses Maimonides, uh, His Life and Thought. And um, today, um, what we're going to do in the last two classes is look at his, his material on, um, on King, the last part of the Mishnah Torah, which is on on kings, the laws of kings, because it deals with the Messianic era. Um, but um, what I thought we'd look at today is we're going to begin with material on uh, informers, which was a significant issue in the Jewish communities in the Middle Ages. And we'll, we will define what um, that means, what informers are, who informers were. Um, there, are some, there is some material previous to the Middle Ages but also the rather uh, peculiar ability of Jews in Spain to deal with informers in a way that Jews in other countries did not. In other words, uh, we'll look at some material about the fact that the Jews in Spain uh, from, early, from fairly early times had the ability to put people to death, uh, which was um, not uh, in the ability of most Jewish communities to do anything to use capital punishment, um, and or sometimes they had the ability to use some corporal punishment. Um, but uh, we're, so we're going to begin by first of all, uh, do you have the material I sent out? Uh, the let's let's begin first of all with the material, um, which is uh, the laws of wounding and damaging, chapter eight. This is where. Maimonides um, really gets into this topic because it's in the uh, the Sefer Nezikin, which is about tort law, um, and this is you know that's the reason why it, it, it's it's a form of damaging. So um, let's take a look. Um, Suzanne, you want to read the the first one on page one of the material, chapter eight, halacha one. When a person informs about property belonging to a colleague and causes it to be taken by a strong, lawless person, he is required to reimburse the owner from the finest property in his possession. If the person who informs about the property dies, the owner may collect his due from his heirs, as is the law concerning others who cause damage. Whether the strong, lawless person is a Gentile or a Jew, the person who informs about the property to be taken by him is considered a mosir, mm -hmm. informer, or a slanderer, and is required to reimburse the owner for everything taken by the lawless person. This applies even if the mosir did not actually hand the other person's property over to the lawless person, but merely informed him about it. So, <laughs> so what's the situation? Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> the... the, the Government wants the stuff of the Jews, right? Or the yeah, although he says it doesn't have to be a Gentile. In right. effect, what is the the Moser, the, uh, the, the informer doing? He's going to whoever is the authority and saying, hey, so-and-so is holding back on you, right. is hiding property, right? Okay. Um, and... Uh, Assuming... Say from taxation or something? Yeah, exactly, from taxation or even because the government's going around seizing people's property, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this is what it means, okay? Someone who is doing that. And so very specifically, initially, this law is about uh, property loss. Well, is, this guy, is it possible that this guy, the wrongdoer, yeah. is a form of tax collector? Responsible for ending up what the Jews have. I mean, is he, i.e., quasi governmental official? Well, that's a very good question, and it brings up the issue of the relationship of the Jewish community to a Gentile government. Okay, and there is a rather there's a this is a rather complicated issue, um, and you tend to find two streams of thought in classical Talmudic literature on this. In Babylonia, and this is reflected in the Babylonian Talmud, um, the government um, at the time of the evolution of rabbinic, uh, the rabbinic community in Babylonia was relatively benign in the sense that it pretty much let the Jews rule themselves. Okay, there was, you know, there was, 
There were some periods of persecution, but generally speaking, the Jewish community was left to its own devices, as long as it paid the taxes to the empire, in this case, the Persians, one of the later Persian empires. Um, and there developed the, um, the doctrine of what's called Dina de Malchuta Dina, which is Aramaic for the law of the land is law meaning as uh, people in a Gentile society under a Gentile emperor or a king, you must follow the law of the land um, uh, unless it is a you know, law that's persecuting you or denying you the right to uh, practice your religion. Okay, So there's that stream. You, you live as a, a lawful citizen of your country. Give and, to Caesar what is Caesar. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> And, and, in, and in Babylonia, the Jews were, in effect, a kind of self-governing entity. In other words, they had their own courts. Um, it was very much like what went on in medieval Europe they, and, and, in, and in the later Islamic empires. They had their own courts. They basically dealt with most of their own uh, uh, you know, law. Uh, the difference was in uh, criminal law, certain kinds of criminal law, like murder and things like that. There were times when the king's law took precedent, you know, were the ones that had the power, so the Jewish courts did not have complete um, uh, legal authority, but they had considerable amount of legal authority over their own members. And this was the model that you found in most of the com later communities in the Middle Ages. Um, so that was one model. Now, in the land of Israel, the community there was under a Roman government that was often corrupt, um, and later on, when um, the empire became Christian, they were often persecuted. Um, so you find in the earliest strains of rabbinic literature, first of all, um, while there are some rabbis who express the idea that the Romans have brought peace and order, the others are, they see it as an oppressive government. And the Romans, you know, one can argue both ways. On the one hand, the Jews had a legal right in the Roman Empire and had legal rights. On the other hand, um, there were times when you had, a, like, Caligula who tried to put up a statue of himself in the temple. I mean, you know, and then there was the wars with the Romans, which caused the destruction of the temple. So in Eretz Yisrael, the, the tendency was um, it's okay to cheat the government because they're corrupt anyway. So is that, is that the, that first sentence um, when it says taken by a strong, lawless person. Yeah. So that mean they consider the government their lawless? Well, in this particular case, this is a kind of illegal attempt at seizure, right? Where you have, um, you have some kind of authority that this is not normal taxation, right? Okay? Um, somebody's hiding their property, and somebody else informs on them, all right? So... Um, so you have both these tendencies in the legal tradition. On the one hand, it's okay to cheat a corrupt government because they're corrupt in the first place, and so you do what you have to do to survive. On the other hand, the law of the land is law. What's, uh, oh, don't you look spiffy today. Uh, <laughs> One of the medical school. <laughs> uh, um, and um, Sam, we're with the material. Did you get a copy of it? All right, so here's a copy. Um, Thank you. So... Um, and what's interesting is, of course, this, these, these dynamics get played all throughout Jewish history right down to the present day um, because it even applies, it's been, some of these issues have come up even in Israel where groups of anti-Zionist Haredim who don't recognize the government, you know, <laughs> they're not following Dina, Malchuta, Dina de Malchuta Dina, you know, I mean, and, and the point is, but I'll give you an example that I know of or reported from my own uh, family. Uh, my family originally came from a, a small town in Poland, um, and um, my grandfather left when it was still part of the Russian Empire uh, before the First World War. Anyway, one of his cousins... Um, what was the town? A town was called Lagov in Yiddish, Wogov in Polish, uh, in southwestern Poland. Uh, and a lot of the Jews um, uh, who emigrated to Toronto... Uh, before the Second World War came from that part of Poland, okay? And you find a lot of the Landsman Shop and societies named after a lot of these little towns and, and so on and so forth. And I guess, you know, somebody went over and then they brought that relatives. My grandfather ended up in Toronto because his brother-in-law was already there, that kind of thing. 
So um, anyway, one of our one of our cousins was a guy named um, Joe Salzberg. Uh, Joe Salzberg had the distinction of being the only communist um, politician ever to be elected to the provincial legislature in uh, in Ontario. Uh, he uh, he was uh, he was Jewish communist and be he represented the Jewish district of Toronto at the time. This was in the 30s, I think. Um, Salzberg eventually broke with the Communist Party, obviously, and he ended up. Um, uh, writing a column regularly in the Canadian Jewish News, and one of the things, it was very nostalgic in some ways, and he would talk about, he left our uh, town, our family's town, late enough that he still remembered a lot of things that went on there. So one of the things he related was is that um, in the local area, when a new governor that appointed, was appointed by the Russian government, if the governor was honest everybody was terribly upset. Why? Because the laws against the Jews were so restrictive in terms of their actual, the actual laws against their economic, um, that the only way they managed to survive was by bribing government officials. And this was considered perfectly legitimate, but if you got a guy in who was honest and followed by the book, it was gonna cause a lot of people trouble. So this is a perfect example of it where the Russian government is corrupt and it's oppressive, and therefore Dina del Mahuta, Dina, the law of the land of law does not apply in that circumstance, right? Because otherwise you can't survive. All right, so this is the situation. Now take a look at Halakha 3, and um, he gives you an example of this. So uh, Suzanne, you wanna read the second one? What is implied? A king decreed that wine, straw, or the like should be brought to him. Mosir arose and said, So-and-so has a storehouse of wine or straw in this and this place. If the king's servants went and took possession of the other person's property, the Mosir is required to compensate him. If the king compelled this Mosir to go and show him the storehouses of wine or straw, or to show him property belonging to a colleague who is fleeing from the king, and the Mosir showed him because of the compulsion, he is not liable. If he had not shown these resources to the king, he would have been beaten mm -hmm. or killed. So the law is, is if somebody is forced to reveal, and the implication is, is that this is not normal taxation. This mm -hmm. is seizure of property by a king, <coughs> right? And so, you see here, this is, at the moment, this is treated as a property damage issue, okay? And therefore, one must compensate and accept if one is compelled, mm -hmm. all right? However, the term goes much broader than that. And here is, uh, here's where we can go back, uh, before we go back to Maimonides, we can go to one of the texts in the Talmud that discusses uh, various kind of evil people. All right? So, uh, Ermin, do you want to read? This is from Babylonian Talmud, uh, Tractate Rosh Hashanah. But as for the Menim and the informers, Mosrim, and the scoffers who rejected the Torah and denied the resurrection of the dead, and those who abandoned the ways of the community, and those who spread their terror in the land of the living, and who sinned and made the masses sin, like Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and his fellows, these will go down to Gehenna and be punished there for all generations. Okay, um, and then they give you a bunch of proof texts. We don't have to read those. Uh, these are the people that are going to hell, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and are being going to hell forever, basically. Uh, and who are they? Well, the heretics, the meaning, that's what that means, the informers, mm -hmm. The scoffers, the people who rejected the Torah, denied, abandoned the ways of the community, spread their... I mean, this is a pretty list of really horrible people. And the informers are listed. If you turn over the page, you'll see uh, Rashi's comment on this, his, his, his definition of the informers. This is from his commentary to the Talmud, says, those who hand over the property of Jews to the non-Jews. So he is very specifically saying this is people who, because of their informing to whoever, the government or whatever, Jews lose their property. So that is one way to very specifically look at this issue. But you can imagine that informers could also do a heck of a lot more damage. 
and could come under a lot of other possible categories, right? So here's where we're going to go back to our book and we're going to look at what Maimonides wrote in later on in this chapter that we have um, uh, looked at. Um, let me find this. Hang on. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, it's on page 165. Um, he has... Um, uh, so, you know, uh, in the part that I gave you, the first halachot, the rest of the chapter up until the part I'm showing you, he has gone on to define various ways of dealing with this and, you know, uh, what the fines are and so on and so forth. But then he starts doing some very interesting stuff here, which reflects his time. And as I mentioned at the beginning, those who weren't here at the beginning, informing was a very serious problem in the Jewish communities I would say more so in Christian Europe than it was in Islamic countries, but it was a significant social problem. And there is a large body of literature, uh, legal literature from the Middle Ages about informers, and there's a great deal of scholarly, modern scholarly material about it as well. And we'll get to so that. It was less of a problem in Islam, under Islam because they were more ethical. <laughs> Well, they also had a more well. They also had a more regular tax system. I think I mentioned this before that under Islamic law, non-Muslims, the protected communities of Christians, Jews, and a few others, um, had to pay a poll tax, right? But that poll tax was very regular. It didn't change that much over the centuries, and as a result of it, and there were always exceptions to this, but primarily it meant that if you lived in a Muslim country, you knew how much you had to pay in taxes every year to the Muslim government. And as we looked at some texts before, if you were a poor person, the community often paid on your behalf. In other words, it was it created economic stability. Well, another way, another way of saying that is to say that the Muslims, who, the guys who were in power, yeah, weren't didn't always have their hand out to rip off some Jews. Exactly. Exactly. I, I mean, <laughs> but but. But, but it, and because it was ordained by Islamic law, it gave it a, a power and a legitimacy that Muslim rulers didn't tend to. Uh, they were more. They were more conservative in observing yeah, exactly. the law and the religion. Exactly. Whereas in in Christian Europe, there was no such regular law, and what you found was a wide variation in how Jews got taxed and how they could be. You know, a ruler could decide he wanted something and could. Right. In effect, the Jews became cash cows for a lot of uh, rulers in, in Europe and were subjected in some cases to ruinous taxations on, on their economic activities and so on. And that went all the way up into uh, the 20th century in, uh, in, in Imperial Russia. It was one of the reasons why Russia was one of the worst places for Jews to live in. Um, people often think about the physical violence, but even worse was the economic oppression. And that's the reason why two and a half million Jews left the Russian Empire from the 1880s to 1914. Largest movement of Jews in Jewish history. Okay? I, I thought that there was physical violence. There was. That describe, what you're saying is it's much more than the physical violence. Absolutely. There was some physical violence in the 1880s. There was the assassination. Of there were these pogroms that were partially government sponsored, but they actually killed not that many people. But what it was, there was an intentional policy of the Russian government to, in effect, uh, cause Jews to emigrate. They, they wanted to get rid of them. But they also had very ruinous economic policies, and Jews could just go across the border. <clears throat> and this had been happening for quite a long time. It's why so many Jews emigrated to the um, Austria-Hungarian Empire, where there were a lot more liberal economic policies. In fact, in, in the 19th century, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire was one of the best places in Europe to live as a Jew. I mean, okay, aside from going to America or right, right. some cases England. Um, and you find literally, you know, there were actually there was a part of Poland, Galicia, that was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And there were Jews who were literally moving in there from across the border, so to speak because they could, they could live better. And so uh, sometimes if you look at the history of some individuals, you will find their ancestors moved from Russian Poland to austria Hungary to Vienna, and, you know, uh, and then to America, right? And, it's, and that's because they were getting away from the Russians. Okay, so let's take a look at page 165. Irma, you want to read a little more? It is forbidden. Um, <clears throat> it is forbidden to give either another... <clears throat> 
person or his property into the hand of a heathen, even if the other is wicked and a sinner, and if he causes one distress and pain. If one gives another person or his property into the hands of a heathen, he has no share in the world to come. And here he's reflecting that text in the Talmud. Okay? So, all right, now take a look at the next one. An informer may be killed anywhere, even at the present time when we do not try cases involving capital punishment, and it is permissible to kill him before he has informed. Okay. As soon as one says that he is about to inform against so-and-so's person or property, even a trivial amount of property, he surrenders himself to death. He must be warned and told, do not inform. And then, if he is impudent and replies, not imprudent, no, impudent, impudent. and replies, mm -hmm. not so, I shall inform against so-and-so, it is a religious duty to kill him. And he who hastens to kill him acquires merit. All right, so he's now reflecting a far more serious mm -hmm. issue, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... What does it mean even at the present time when we do not try cases involve capital punishment? It means that in Maimonides' day, legally, there was no, not, I'm not talking about external legal power, but even internally, externally, Jews had not been allowed to do capital cases since the Roman times. The Romans at one point forbid Jewish courts to, uh, they took the power of capital punishment. And in the places where the Jews lived, cases that regard for capital punishment, like murder, were usually handled by the local, handled by the local government, whether Islamic or Christian. Jewish courts did not have the power to try capital cases. Okay, so, but internally it was also impossible, legally it was impossible, because according to Jewish law, only the Sanhedrin was allowed to try capital cases, the ancient court. Now, there was no Sanhedrin, hadn't been for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, why? Well, the Sanhedrin got dissolved, but the point is also there was a catch-22 in trying to revive it. And there were different times in Jewish history where they talked about reviving the Sanhedrin. What's the problem? The only you have to be a properly ordained judge to be a member of the Sanhedrin. It's not the title rabbi. In other words, that's a totally different, that, that's kind of, the, the medieval term for rabbi was not a, uh, what was considered a, a ordained judge from ancient times that could sit on the Sanhedrin. The problem is, the catch-22 is, you had to have someone who was already an ordained judge of the Sanhedrin to ordain somebody else. So the Jews in the Middle Ages had the problem is, who's going to ordain somebody if there isn't anybody who already is ordained? Uh, in the 16th century, they actually were talking about reviving the Sanhedrin um, and talking about how they would go about it uh, kind of if all the sages of Israel agreed, they would then, in effect, start the process. And it has been discussed in modern times in Israel by the Orthodox community there of starting the Sanhedrin again. Um, and in fact, among some of the ultra-Orthodox... As a court. Yes, as, as yes, a court. as a ruling court. And in fact, the, um, in some of the ultra-Ortho, the Haredim, they want to replace a democracy with a theocracy and they would, which would, the, 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 there'd be a council of Torah sages, which would in effect be for them a step towards the re revival of the Sanhedrin. Uh, others would say the Sanhedrin will not be revived until the Messiah comes. Okay? So, internally, Jews, even if the government had said it's okay to do it, they legally, according to Jewish law, could not try capital cases. But what has he just said, however? Well, this is outside of trial. This yeah. is kind of vigilantism. Ah, uh, well, you could... I, I, sanctioned vigilantism. <laughs> yes, you could put it that way. Or, in fact, it is putting the informer under a different category of Jewish law. And that is the law of the rodef, the pursuer. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and there's a category of Jewish law where if you see someone going after somebody, the classic case, it's not found in the Bible, it's a, it's a rabbinic thing that is, they you know, find a couple of biblical texts that base it on, you are allowed to kill somebody who you reasonably think or has expressed his intention of going to kill somebody. You can use whatever means necessary 
to stop that person in order to save the life. And that can, the, the, you're supposed to wound them, in fact, you know, but if you need to kill them, <laughs> right, that, that's the point, yes. Um, this, is the, this is the connection to the Torah study last week. Um, but you are allowed to kill them if necessary. So what, what happens is, is that the informer, the Moser, is put under the category of the Rodef. Now notice you're supposed to warn them, right? Uh, because that's an important part of the issue of the Rodef, and even in terms of capital punishment, uh, the would-be killer is supposed to be warned of the, so that they're doing it in full conscious uh, understanding that they are breaking the law. That's why it has a right to do it. Right, right, exactly. Right. Well, it's the, not the Balaka law, it's the, it's the law of the land that they're breaking. Uh, no, no, they're breaking, they're, they're, uh, they're, in this particular case with the informer, mm -hmm. they are, um, th they're not necessarily going to kill somebody, although what they might do might result in somebody's death. They are going to be informing against an individual or the community to the Gentile government, which could cause the community great damage, if not outright danger to life and limb. I understand, but if they pursue him by the law of Rodef and kill him, yes. they're breaking the law of the land, not the, not the Halakha law. W right, exactly. Well, they might be, yes. But as we will see, mm -hmm. that wasn't necessarily so in Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, you know, you raise a good question, <coughs> Sam. I, I, in a country where the Jews did not have any right of capital punishment if somebody saw somebody going after somebody and they jumped them and they had to kill them, I doubt whether the local court would um, convict them. of. They would probably, you know, let them go, right? But yeah, according to Jewish law, even though there's no proper trial in Sanhedrin, in order to preserve life, you're allowed to kill the pursuer. Sort of within the rubric of self-defense. Yes, it's, it's, it could be communal self-defense, yeah, yeah. okay? You said... Something which I think is very important. The Jews had no right to um, to try capital punishment. Yes, they had no right for capital. In other words, if if one Jew murdered another, the local authorities were the ones who took care of that, right? I've heard of that in Roman times, you know, but. This is well, there, there were there was a, according to the rabbinic understanding, the Jews did have the right of capital punishment in Roman times, but then the Romans stopped that. The question is, we're not sure whether the Jews actually ever had that right in under Roman occupation. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably a, again, it must have varied from country to country. I honestly don't know if the Jews in the Persian Empire had the right. Probably not. Mo most of the time, capital crimes were were dealt with by um, the uh, the government at the, whatever they were living. I mean, it was one of the things, of course, the Jews wanted. One of the reasons why they wanted their own government to be reestablished so that they could live under their own laws rather than somebody else's laws. Okay, because actually, the Jewish laws, the rabbinic laws, I will say, of capital punishment are extremely restrictive. Under by under modern uh, terms of evidence and so on, virtually impossible to convict anybody. Okay. As, I'll just say, and Maimonides mentions there's actually a way around that, however. They gave, in other words, if they know somebody was guilty of a murder, but they couldn't prove it, according, this again is all in the Talmud, and it's probably theoretical, but if you knew somebody was a murderer, but you could not convict them because of the rules of evidence, and so on and so forth, ah, you threw them into a dank, dark place and basically let them die of neglect. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know whether that ever was carried out. It's probably a completely theoretical discussion, but it's kind of interesting that uh, they, they, they found a way around that if somebody was known to be a, a terrible murderer. Okay, so in other words, so he's now in Halakha 10. He has now categorized the informer under the same rules as the rodef, the pursuer. Okay, let's take a look at number 11. Where, where is that on 166? 166. Uh, if the informer has carried out his intention and given information, it is my opinion that we are not allowed to kill him unless he is a confirmed informer, in which case he must be killed lest he inform against others. Okay, this is an important point. If you don't catch the pursuer and he murders somebody, then immediately that comes under the whole category in rabbinic law of of capital punishment law. You're not allowed to then just go and kill him. But notice Maimonides says, 
we're not allowed to kill him if he has done his informing because now it's not a, you know, now it comes under a whole other rules, but we are allowed to kill him um, in case he may do it against others. In other words, it's a preventative. So here, the, they're giving quite a large latitude to go after informers. Well, read them. So it couldn't be the first, first offense. It says if he is a confirmed informer, yes. it suggests that we know that this guy does this. Yes, exactly. In other words, we know that he has been informing. We haven't caught him in the act before, but we know that he's been doing it. And so we're allowed to kill him now so that it to stop him from doing it uh, before. And by the way, again, we're not now just talking about property damage. We're talking about accusations against the Jewish community that could cause a pogrom. Right? And as you will see, that's exactly what was going on in some cases. It was a serious problem, um, often having to do with monetary stuff, but not always with monetary stuff. Read on. There are frequently cases in the cities of the Maghrib where informers who are known to reveal people's money are killed or are handed over to the heathen authorities to be executed, beaten, or imprisoned as befits their crime. Okay, stop there. Now, what does he mean by this? The Maghreb he's referring to is uh, to the west, North Africa, and Spain. He's, uh, he's, he recognizes that although in Egypt they don't have the power to do this, there are places in the Jewish community where they can kill informers. <coughs> or they're handed over to the authorities to be the, killed. The heathen authorities. Yes, meaning the non-Jewish authorities. Well, if they've, but the crime they've committed is really a crime against Jews. Yes. So why would the heathens kill them or, or, or punish them? That's a good point. Uh, there, there are times when the authorities in, um, in the, where the Jews lived um, recognized that this was a bad social problem and would cooperate with the Jewish courts in getting rid of these guys. See, what's, to me, what's fascinating about this is, yeah, this is a special class of law for people who are not in, who are people not in power under someone else's power. Yes, have their own community. Yep, which isn't in sync, fully in sync. Who ever heard of such a thing? But we've had this going on all along. I yep. was just reading about Harren Arendt and the Eichmann trial. Yes. And some of the things about, you know, about some of the informers within the, uh, within the, uh, the camps. Right. And all of this. So, so we, we have this huge history of this and it's a special class of law which only exists within a subgroup. Absolutely. And it's, and it's incredible. It, it, but here they've, they've taken the person out of that subgroup into the main group to do their... I, I don't in other words, the, 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 the local government often cooperated with the Jewish courts to punish these people. And we're going to look at a very specific like case. It's punishing, like punishing them for helping them. Right. Yeah. right. Well, Not necessarily, because if a person goes out and does some kind of informing which could cause a pogrom, it was in the interest of the local authorities to maintain peace and order, mm -hmm. right? They didn't want yes. their Jewish communities to be attacked. They were sources yes. of income. Okay. You uh, know? I, I, I'd really love to see those cases. Well, we're going to look at one that's a, an infamous case that her, occurred in the 13th century. Um, but you're right that this issue has come... I mean, if you, if you look at the article in the Encyclopedia Judaica on informers... There's two parts to it. There's the historical part and there's the legal part, where the second part discusses the legal evolution of laws about informers. The first part is the historical one, starting with Talmudic stuff, and it goes right down into 20th century Russia with the Bayless case, the famous blood libel case in Russia. Okay? So um, <clears throat> this has been, and they discuss what was going on in Eastern Europe. This is discussed. What went on in the camps. I don't That's think it went on, it discusses what happened in the Holocaust. Um, that, that, that I don't remember. But the, the point is, yes, this was an issue in any place where the Jews were in the minority under, under a, a press of a government or where there was potential for violence against the community from the masses, all right, or even the government. So someone, it, it's not just about property damage. I mean, that's bad enough. I mean, the Jews could lose a huge amount of, of their 
important re economic resources if somebody goes and claims that they're illegally hoarding stuff or whatever, but it also could cause, you know, a pogrom that could kill people. So this is a very big problem. Um, and it's, because, it's a bigger problem in Christian Europe than it is in Islamic countries. Okay, that's, that's the interesting thing because there was, again, relative to the Christian world, there was relatively little violence against Jews in Islamic countries, at least up to the 13th century, okay? In other words, yes, there were very specific instances where the Jewish community was attacked or whatever, but they are relatively few over hundreds and hundreds of years compared to what went on in Christian countries, okay? But how do you account for that? Uh, that's a very good question, and, and also that was an issue that was, has been debated by scholars about sure. were, did the Jews live live better under Islam than Christianity, and it has gone back and forth and back and forth, but the, basically the answer is yes, they did. It, not in the later period necessarily, but in the sort of from the, from the 8th century to the 13th century, let's say, uh, that was the period uh, where the Jews enjoyed the most rights and whatever. Again, there were isolated instances, and there's a whole complex series of reasons why they were um, uh, uh, more open to violence, um, which you know is beyond the purview of this. But there, yes, it, it, well, it's it's quite uh, it's quite extensive. I think a, you know, a major reason would be the way Christians <clears throat> view Jews versus Muslims view. Yes, Jews. Christ killers versus yes. they didn't have. Absolutely, didn't have that. absolutely. The the anti uh, what we would refer to as anti Semitism, but really properly viewed as anti Judaism was far more prevalent in Christianity because Christianity had absorbed, first of all, Hellenistic anti-Judaism. You're right, there was this issue of, um, although uh, the Muslims viewed Judea Judaism and Christianity as kind of out of date things, mm -hmm. they never really felt threatened by them internally. Um, there was a whole series of things against Jews throughout Christian history. Um, and, and there were also some important social and legal issues involved in this. So yes, there was popular anti-Semitism, we would again call it anti-Semitism. Uh, there's been studies of this, the Jews were associated with the devil, there was all kinds of material attacking the Jews in early church fathers that created certain themes um, that ended up in legal, uh, and, but then there was the social issues. The Jews in the Islamic empire were viewed by the Muslims as indigenous peoples. They were there when they, when the, before the Muslim Empire there. They were protected communities. They were legal residents under Roman law. And the Muslims essentially took over that. Um, and so they viewed the Jews as kind of the native communities that lived there. So, and they lived there for a very, very long time. This was true in certain parts of Christian Europe, southern France um, and Spain to some extent. Um, and so there was a certain sense in which the Jews were part of the landscape. In Northern Europe, however, the Jews were not longtime residents, and so they were seen as foreigners and interlopers. So that's an important point as well. And even though the Christians absorbed the legal rights that Jews had under Roman law, it was a lot weaker. And the Jews' legal positions in Europe declined rapidly um, in the 13th, uh, late 13th, and especially in the 14th century. Um, and that's the reason why you begin to see at the end of the 13th century the beginning of expulsions of Jews from countries in Europe, starting with uh, England in tw uh, 1290, and then in France in 1310, and then in various German cities, and then finally the mass expulsion from Spain. So the Jews had a lot less legal standing, and you don't find the kind of mass expulsions that you do uh, in Islamic countries. You know, I know that's not what we're here to talk about, but yeah. why, why did that happen in Europe? What happened? That, they, that these people became less tolerant of Jews in the 12, 12 1300s. Well, part of it in goes... In Spain, we think of it as sort of combined with getting rid of the Muslims, and the, and the, but that's not... It's a case. complex thing, but part of it is they didn't need them anymore. In other words, England is, a, is an important case history. Um, because the economic activity of the Jews in Christian Europe was often restricted, which was not the case in Muslim countries, by the way, uh, Jews, um, for example, became uh, uh, moneylenders, which was illegal for Christians originally become moneylenders. Eventually, Christians ended up ignoring that law. But, for example, in England, 
William the Conqueror brought Jews from Normandy, and there was a fairly extensive community in Normandy, in, Normandy, in Rouen. Rouen was an important Jewish center. Uh, Northern France, there were a fair Jean number of Jews. That's the town of Joan of Arc. Yes, well... I wonder if she, she was probably Jewish. No, but Rashi lived in Northern That's Europe. That's right, Northern France. Uh, so Northern, Northern France was a center of Ashkenazic Jewry, okay? The, the core area of Ashkenaz was the Rhineland, but Northern France was, and so Normandy had a Jewish population. So uh, William the Conqueror brought Jews from Normandy, probably from Rouen, um, into England specifically to act as moneylenders to, uh, for the economy. And he established, uh, Jews were established in major centers throughout England, um, and that was what they did. And in fact, there was a special office of the exchequer that dealt with collecting the taxes from the Jews who were moneylenders, um, because the, 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 the Norman government, which was one of the most centralized governments in medieval Europe, um, and kept very close bureaucratic tab on all kinds of things, I'm sure you've heard of the Doomsday Book, um, they, had, they, they got a lot of money from Jewish money lending. In other words, they took a lot off uh, a percentage of their, a uh, huge percentage of their profits. Nonetheless, the Jews managed to flourish very well. There were some of the wealthiest Jews in Europe lived in England. Well, yeah, there was, a, there, was, there, was a, there was a guy, a Jew in, in Norwich, who had a stone house, which apparently is still there today. And uh, when he died, he had such extensive uh, loans out throughout Europe that the government essentially seized his estate, and it took him 10 years to, to bring all the loans in. So they were brought in for a very specific purpose, and when they were no longer needed, because now the Northern Italians, the Lombards were, were the major financiers. In other words, when Christians basically stopped, it was started ignoring their own law, and there were major moneylenders, um, the Jews became the small-time moneylenders, which of course doesn't endear them to the local population. Um, and, um, and so what you found, for example, in England is you, there were some anti-Jewish riots, like in the town of York, where they basically murdered the entire community, but what was the first thing that when these riots occurred that they would do is they would go to the local office of the Exchequer and burn all the loan records. Okay? So when in 1290, when Edward I, who was a, became, was a very pious Christian, decided he did not want the infidel Jews anymore in his, and they didn't need them economically, they expelled them. And so there was this rise of this kind of anti-Jewish piety uh, coupled with the fact that economically they didn't really need them anymore, um, and um, so th and and also their legal position, whereas as I said, in many places they kind of had a long ancient established legal right of residence, that was completely changed. The position of the Jews in Europe became they were reduced legally to the property of the king. They became chattel. Legally, they became chattel. And so they were allowed to be kicked out. And so that's why you see these series of expulsions, so that by 1500, with, some, with exceptions of Italy and southern France, um, there, were, there were virtually no Jews in Western Europe. And they had all moved uh, to uh, Eastern Europe and to the uh, Ottoman Empire. Okay? But it's just a fact of life. Okay, okay. That's so that's great. a long uh, thing. Great. Um, the, we don't have to really read the rest of it. If one oppresses the community... Uh, well, no, read the next paragraph. Similarly. Uh, similarly, if one oppresses the community and troubles them, it is permissible to hand him over to the heathen authorities to be beaten, imprisoned, and fined. But if one merely distresses an individual, he must not be handed over. Although the punishment of an informer is permitted, it is forbidden to destroy his property, for it belongs to his heirs. And notice the second last paragraph. It's not, he expands the law to not just cover informers. In other words, if somebody in the community is causing the community a tremendous amount of problem, he's allowed to be handed over to the heathen authorities. Now, there's a long tradition of you don't hand people over to the heathen authorities, right? That is like considered to be a traitor to your community. But there are instances where you are allowed to hand them over. Okay, so now we get to what actually happened. We saw that Maimonides says that in the Maghreb they had this power. This was a highly unusual situation in medieval times, and nobody is 100% sure how this came about. But in Spain, the Jews had the right of capital punishment and corporal punishment, meaning 
mutilation in many cases for informing. In other words, if there was, or other related crimes. In other words, if there was a murder that was handled by the local authorities, okay? But if a member of the Jewish community was caught as an informer, the local Christian authorities allowed the community to take care of them. Now, they weren't necessarily the executioners. Uh, that, I, I don't know who, I, it was probably Christians, the Christian courts actually did the actual execution. Um, but this right of capital punishment by the Jews of Spain go, went back into the Islamic period. There is, there, there, the, the Jews themselves say this, that it was a long established right in Spain that the Jews <coughs> had the right of capital punishment for informers. There is some possibility that it even went back earlier to pre-Islamic Spain. But there is a lot of discussion of this in the 13th and 14th centuries. What happens is, is that um, as uh, the, situa the legal situ position of the Jews in Spain begins to decline in the 14th century and the fi early 15th century, this is long before the expulsion, the right of this begins to be taken away. But up until the 15th century, some communities still had this right. And you can actually see specific instances of this. So, I want to give you one of the most important and infamous cases. Yes? Just in general, can you give me a little a rough idea what kind of, what does informing mean? I mean, in, in terms of property, what are they going to say and do? What? The Jewish community is hiding stuff from the king's tax collectors. Right? Or so and so is hiding. He's not declaring all of what he has. Right? Or um, the Jews are murdered a Christian child. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about what could, at public accusations. Mm -hmm. It also began to extend to Jews who did something incredibly unseemly in public that would bring dis, uh, disrepute and possibly danger to the Jewish community. And we'll, I'll mention a couple of cases eventually. So here is one of the most famous cases that occurred around 1270 in Spain, in the Kingdom of Aragon. Now, you have to understand, at this time, Spain was divided into a number of different uh, kingdoms. Uh, the Kingdom of Aragon included not only technically the what was Aragon, but Valencia and a couple other territories. So the King of Aragon was one of the more powerful rulers in Spain. This was at a time when there still was a Muslim state in uh, Granada. Um, but this, now the problem is, is that I could not find a translation of the, um, the original sources. So this is a narrative that was put together from the sources by uh, Alfred uh, Abraham A. Newman, not Alfred Newman, um, uh, from an old book of the history of the Jews of Spain, dating from, I think, the 30s, okay? Uh, and, and I like that his narrative is quite good, because he, he, he does it in very colorful terms. So, George, you want to read it? The villain Vidalon, is that how you say yeah, it? Yeah, I guess so. Is it Vidalia? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Son of Astrug de Porta. That was their Spanish names. Right, mm -hmm. and the deporta was a was one of the names that Jews had. Okay, it was a Jewish name. It was a Jewish name, an Astro. Yeah, go on. Uh, was the black sheep in one of the wealthiest and most influential families in Barcelona? Vidalon carried on his nefarious work over a number of years during the reign of James I of Aragon. His career reached a tragic denouement, however, early in the reign of Pedro the Third. When this monarch, as his at, at, Should be at, his, at his instigation, issued a threatening summons to the Ahamas of Aragon and Valencia to appear before him in answers to representatives that had evidently been laid before him. Now, the uh, uh, Lamas, or however you pronounce it, uh, Alhamas, uh, that is the, uh, under, uh, it is a term that refers to the non Christian communities, but in uh, in other words, the um, uh, in each town there was a recognized community, legal community, um, and it referred it, it generally referred to to Jewish and Muslim communities. But in this case, it's referring to the Jewish communities. So this Vidalon somehow, 
And by the way, there had already been a in Aragon a, a significant um, um, anti-Jewish public event. Um, in um, about 20 years before this, 1240, 1250, ah, I'm, I can't remember the exact date, there had been a public disputation between a Jewish convert and the great and the chief rabbi of Barcelona, Moses ben Nachman, Nachmanides, the Barcelona Disputation, which was, uh, was um, we have two accounts of it, one a Latin account and one Nachmanides' own account. And Nachmanides was forced to flee the country afterwards. He ended up immigrating to Israel, where he died some years later. Um, but following the Barcelona disputation, there had been some anti-Jewish legislation that had come about. So this was at a time when the situation in Aragon was quite tense. Okay. So, so what we have here is Vitalon has called, has caused a problem <clears throat> in which the Jews have to appear. The community has to appear. All these different communities in Aragon, from all the various centers were accused by this Vitalon of what we don't know exactly, but in got the king so upset that he, in effect, wanted, he was calling them all in for a confrontation. And given the, the touchy situation that had been going on there for a while, you can understand how afraid the community probably was. So this was an extremely serious situation, although we're not 100% sure exactly what it was he accused them of. Right. Do you right. suppose the nefarious work he was carrying on consists of? Going to the king and telling them terrible stuff about what was going on in the Jewish community. Probably about hidden taxes. Possibly about, you know, the, the, the Jews are really your enemy and all this kind of stuff. In other words, you have to understand the, there were some influential families that had access to the royal court. This is one of the problems that occurred in the Middle Ages, that there were certain Jews often referred to as court Jews, who held high office with the Gentile authorities that gave them uh, incredible access and secondly, exempted them from the authority of the Jewish community. In other words, they could refuse to pay their taxes that the community had to pay. Uh, they could, in effect, make their own deal with the local ruler. And the community didn't have, couldn't, there was a, it was very hard for the community to do anything with them because of their influence with the court. So some people think that the rash of informing had to do with the rise of this concept of the court Jew. Okay. Well, this guy was a black sheep in a family. So he had all these, you know, brothers and sisters and people who were big shot, good, you know, his whole of people, and he was a carry on, carry and on. jealous. <laughs> well, his family had been for quite a while, evidently, a very important family, a Jewish family in Barcelona, with obviously a lot of connections with the royal court. And if he got to the king and started telling him the stuff, and the king believed him. Uh, even though the rest of his family didn't like him, uh, he obviously had a lot of access, okay? So he was a major troublemaker. Read on. What ensued at the royal conference and what consequences followed for the Juderes. Juderias. Juderias? Juderias. Juderias. Yeah. That's Spanish. Juderias. Juderias technically uh, means the Jewish quarters. In other words, the parts of the towns where the Jews lived. Mm -hmm. And in many places you can still see where the, in Spain today where those were. And scholars actually know exactly the street, there's been some, sure, sure. where the Juderias were, okay? So here he's using the term as a synonym for the uh, Al Hamas, okay? Right, so what consequences followed for the Juderias? Yeah. The kingdom is not clear, but as for the traitor, his doom was sealed. From all the Alhamas, they, there arose the cry that the informer should be brought to trial, and even Vitalon's family joined in the movement to bring the proceedings before the aged rabbi Jonah Gerundi and his uh, younger colleague Solomon Ibn Ad Adret. Now, so in other words, the, all the Jewish authorities got together at this summons by the royal court, and they managed to convince the king that this guy, in fact, was an evil informer, and they asked that he be brought to trial, and evidently he pissed off people in his own family, and so they joined in these denunciations. 
um, and they wanted him to be brought before the two greatest halachic authorities in the kingdom of Aragon. Okay, Rabbi Jonah Garundi was the basically the chief rabbi of the kingdom, one of the greatest halachic authorities of his day, but by this point he was fairly old, and his younger column, uh, colleague, Shlomo Ibn Adret. When Garundi died, Ibn Adret became the chief halachic authority in Aragon and one of the greatest halachic authorities in Europe. And in fact, we have hundreds of his responsa. He was one of the guys who actually... Um, is the basis of the idea that you're not supposed to study the Kabbalah until you're 40 years old. He was very... Adret? Ibn Adret, yeah, Ibn Adret. Um, he, um, he was very suspicious of the study of philosophy and Kabbalah. He didn't, actually didn't like Kabbalah. This was at a time when Kabbalah was becoming a lot more popular, um, especially in northern Spain. Uh, Garona was one of the centers of it, which was where Garundi came from and was one of the... Um, part of the Kingdom of Aragon, and Ibn Adret didn't like Kabbalah, um, but, you know, he, he wasn't able to hold it off. So here it is, they want Garundi and Ibn Adret to be the judges of, and they want to bring this guy to trial. Read on. However, they're bringing him to trial before a Jewish court. These are yes, judges. the idea is, is that he would be brought to trial before a Jewish court, because, he's because he's an informer, and they have the right to do that under Spanish law. Go on. King Pedro III, who had lent a willing ear to the plottings of the traitor, now ordered his arrest and arraignment, thanks to the intervention at court of the two brothers, Joseph and Moses Abravalia, Abravalia ministers of finance. So these are two court Jews who are ministers of finance for the whole kingdom of Aragon, and they, in fact, went to Pedro III and said, this guy is an evil informer. You ought to listen to the Jewish communities, and you should arrest this guy. So they did. Go on. The two rabbis designated by the king to report their findings and conclusions under the official seal of the, seal of the Chief Justice Ferrer de Manresa who was charged with the execution of the sentence which the rabbis might impose. So in other words, the rabbis would try, would, would write a report, would try the man, but then the, um, the, the civil law this is would carry out the, the punishment. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's kind of what, how the Inquisition worked, by the way. Mm -hmm. The Inquisition did the trials, but they never did the punishment. They talked about when, when the Inquisition wanted somebody executed, they, in effect, they, the term was relaxed the person over to the civil authorities who were the ones who actually carried out the execution. So this was a... And the Inquisition, were, who, what authorities were that? They were church authorities. Of course. All right, right. okay. And there, there is no Inquisition in Spain yet, but yes. the point yeah. is that that sort of legal structure that the actual punishment is not carried out by the religious authorities, was already well established. Mm -hmm. Go on. In pursuance, is yes. right? in pursuance of a royal mandate, Jewish courts throughout the land were set in motion, gathering evidence against the Dalan and forwarding the affidavits to the rabbinical judges. In vain did the rabbis falter, procrastinate, and seek a bloodless compromise. Okay, in other words, the two rabbis were highly reluctant to bring this case to a conclusion. Why? Because this was a prominent family, it, it was very public, they were maybe afraid of the reaction, and perhaps they realized that what they were doing was, even though they had this established right of informers, they understood that technically under Jewish law that it wasn't completely kosher. Right? Go on. When a year passed during which the royal chief justice died, and the rabbis were still seeking delay, Pedro III flew into a rage. He threatened their arrest, and then their verdict of guilty was, uh, guilty was rendered. In other words, they, they, they had to be forced into making a judgment, mm -hmm. right? And, I mean, probably all of this is they were, they were really unhappy with how, you know, this had been involved with the... Uh, most of the informing stuff up at this was probably handled internally, and this was a very public situation with a prominent <clears throat> family and using the, 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 the king's uh, courts and things. They, and undoubtedly they themselves, they, had, they did not want to be involved with something regarding a capital punishment case. Okay, 
But the king wanted this. Over the king time. felt this had to be, and obviously by this point he was he he uh, was convinced this guy was uh, deserved to die. Go on. Vidalon was delivered to the king's officers, and the execution followed in typical Spanish mode. He was led to a square in front of the Jewish burial ground in Barcelona. The veins in his arms were cut, and he bled to death. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about it is that wasn't the end of the case. <laughs> okay. It was an appeal. <laughs> no. No. Um, after Gurundi died, some years later, when Ibn Adret was the chief rabbi, for some reason, the family of Vitalon uh, decided they were they lodged a formal complaint that Ibn Adret and Gurundi had acted completely against Jewish law and had no right to have Vitalon put to death. Okay? Um, and um, Ibn Adret was therefore put in a very difficult position. So, and by the way, we know all about this because it's from a responsa, a responsum of Ibn Adret. That's how we know about most of this information, by the way, the whole case, everything that went on. So Ibn Adret, um, he, again, he, this guy is the greatest uh, Talmudic authority in Spain, pretty, I mean, at least in Aragon and throughout Spain, and one of the greatest minds, Talmudic minds in Europe. He feels the need to write the rabbis of France and Germany, who are even considered greater authorities in Talmud than the Spanish rabbis, to ask for their opinions in the matter so that he, in effect, can say, hey, guys, look at this. So he writes this long account of the whole case, and he sends it off to the rabbis of France and Germany. Now, we don't know if any of the other rabbis replied. We have one reply, and the reply was from Rabbi Meir of Rotenberg, who was the greatest Talmudic authority in Ashkenaz. Okay? He, he really was. And he's a, he was a famous rabbi, and we've got tons of his responsa. He was a famous case because at one point he was, um, he decided the situation where he was living was so bad, he tried to leave the country, uh, which was technically illegal. Jews couldn't leave the country without the king's permission. He was taken by the king and held hostage, and um, in effect, uh, for, for ransom. And he told the Jewish community not to ransom him. Uh, because he felt it would establish a precedent where Talmudic scholars could then be thrown and held for ransom by the authorities. So he died in prison, and they wouldn't release his body because they, because they still wanted the ransom. Eventually, some rich guy paid the ransom and got his body released. Uh, this was years later, and had him, had him buried. And this guy, when he died, was buried beside him. And the whole story is on a tombstone inscription. Okay of which there is a copy of it in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, okay? So, Rabbi Meir of Rotenberg knows about problems with the authority. Now, Rotenberg's answer is not as long as Ibn Adret's account, and both Ibn Adret's account and Meir of Rotenberg uh, are filled with all kinds of references to Talmudic literature and previous precedents. And in effect, what Rabbi Meir of Rotenberg said was, what you did was perfectly okay. We don't have the power to do this in Germany. If we did, we would do exactly as you did. That was one of the interesting things. And we do know that the Jews in Germany uh, did have some right of corporal punishment because in Rabbi Meir of Rotenberg's responsa, he refers to someone who was a perpetual wife beater and had the guy's arm cut off, okay, as a punishment, okay? So um, they were not, I mean, look, these are medieval times, right? And medieval punishments. So Rotenberg was no slouch in terms of being willing to use what he needed to do in his own community, but he did not have the right to do this sort of thing. In, in Germany, the, it was a lot more difficult to get anything done like, you, you, they, didn't, they couldn't do this. But in Spain, they did. Okay. Well, it's unfortunate we don't know exactly what Vidalon. Yeah, exactly. Was doing. Exactly. Now, so now we're going to skip to the next generation. Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel is a rabbi in Germany. He is a student of Rabbi Meir of Rotenberg. He himself becomes a great Talmudic authority, and he is forced to leave Germany again because of circumstances. And he makes his way to Spain, where he is elected as the chief rabbi of Toledo. 
one of the most important Jewish communities. And I think Toledo is in the kingdom of Castile. All right? So here it is. You have an Ashkenazic Talmudic authority over a Sephardic community. Okay? And Asher ben Yechiel, we know, uh, he wrote a lot of responsa, as well as a lot of commentaries to the Talmud. Okay? So that's how we know him. Uh, he had two famous sons. He had um, Judah ben Asher, became the chief rabbi of Toledo after him. And his other son, Jacob ben Asher, wrote the second most important legal code of the Middle Ages. In other words, the one that followed Maimonides, is called the Tour. All right? All right? So his son wrote the Tour. Okay? So, his son wrote the door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is a really, this is a scholarly family, okay? So Asher ben Yechiel gets to Spain, and he finds the Jews of Spain are putting informers to death, and also doing things like mutilating people for certain crimes, right? For example, uh, we know this from his responsa, because people ask him, you know, what, you know whether what was they did was right. For example, there was a, apparently a Jewish woman who'd become the mistress of a Spanish nobleman, and she was flaunting it in public. And this was considered, to use the Yiddish term, a shanda to the community. <laughs> and um, they had her nose cut off. Nose. Okay. But now we're going to read what he writes about capital punishment. This is from... Several responsa he is he writes about capital punishment and mutilation as punishments. All right, um, Sam, you're up. You have asked me a difficult question involving a capital crime. In all the countries I have ever heard of, capital matters are not judged by Jews, except here in Spain. That's the situation. He says nobody else has the power to do this. I was greatly puzzled when I first came here how it was possible to judge capital matters with the Sanhedrin not in existence. I was told that this was due to the royal will, and what is more, the Jewish community judges with a view, judges with a view to save life. A great deal more blood would be shed if such cases were judged by the Gentiles. I have therefore let customs stand, though I have never agreed with them, the Jews of Spain, on the subject of the taking of life. Now, what is his rationale for allowing this to occur? Uh, less blood was is, sir, is um, shed. Right. And in fact, his son, in one of his son's responsa, in effect says that even though legally we are not allowed to do this under Talmudic law, we are in a state of martial law. He in effect, he doesn't use that term, but he in effect says in order to protect the community and protect the Torah, we are in times of great danger, and therefore we are allowed to do this in order to save ourselves, even though technically it is illegal. Go on. I have therefore let the custom stand. Oh, I read that. Indeed. Indeed, I note that all of you agree on the elimination of this evil from your midst. There can be no doubt that this man blasphemed openly, and the matter is already known among the Gentiles. A lot of being very strict with those who blaspheme against their law and faith. The blasphemy would assume greater proportions if, in this case, punishment were not meted out by the Jews, perhaps. Mm -hmm. okay. If I were taking counsel with you, I should be inclined to recommend that his tongue be drawn out of his mouth and partly cut off. I note that all of your actions are for the sake of heaven in order to uproot evil from our midst. I've also been told in another place things have turned out for the best as a result of your aid to the benefit of the entire community. The case was somebody went in, Sar uh, in Saragossa. Some guy went out in public and started blaspheming God. Uh, I mean, maybe the guy was mentally unstable. He was saying all kinds of things. And in effect, they knew that this could set off a pogrom. Mm. So they cut his tongue out. But he mentions... You know, he mentioned the case of the Jewish mistress. He mentions in his responsa a number of these things. Um, here's, here's another one from, from his responsa. So the first one is dated around 1320. This one's a little earlier from 1312. Uh, Sam, you want to read it? Uh, question again. about informed by community leaders of Seville. He carries information to the Gentiles about the Jews and about the Jewish community of Seville. 
The Jewish community is very much afraid of this man who can be found every night in the court of one of the most powerful men among the Gentiles. Now the Jews have been granted authority by the crown to try him in secret and have found guilty to execute him. So they've asked him if this is okay, and his answer was, in effect, yes. they did well in sentencing him to hang. Okay. okay. So oh, that's, that's the answer. Response. That's his response, okay? Um, uh, now, the original answer is much longer, um, and, and so on and so forth, but the point is that um, this, this, is, this is a text that's, uh, his, his, his first text is often quoted by, uh, in, in uh, Jewish discussions of capital punishment, by the way. Um, uh, and so here again, here is a Ashkenazic rabbi who um, knows this stuff is technically illegal, it's an established custom. And notice they said tried it in secret in the second one. They, in effect, were using rather what we would call uh, highly questionable um, uh, legal procedures that were not in conformity with typical Jewish legal procedures in order to deal with this. Now, we know that this was also a problem in Ashkenaz because there were a number of community ordinances against informers that were promulgated by the Jewish communities of Ashkenaz going all the way back uh, to the to the I think to the tenth century, but certainly by the eleventh and twelfth century, um, and but they only had the only thing they could do was excommunicate the person, put them under harem. That was as far as they could go. Um, but um, in Spain, they had this long, long established, and this issue was discussed by Spanish rabbis th uh, throughout the fourteenth <coughs> century. There's a lot of discussion of it um, by various authorities. And they all basically come to the same conclusion that, that, you know, we need to do this. But it also shows you the precarious position that the Jews were coming under in Spain, right? Um, and as I said, their position began to legally and socially decline um, in the 14th century, especially towards the end, um, which culminated in massive anti-Jewish pogroms that occurred in the 1390s which was the first time that large numbers of Spanish Jews were forcibly converted to Christianity. And that was the beginning of what you had was a community of conversos, people who were ethnically Jewish but had, on the surface had to become Catholics. Um, what happened was there was also a series, uh, there was also there was a, a famous, uh, and, and this was as a result of a series of disputations in Tortosa, uh, which was disastrous for the community where the Jews were forced to publicly defend their faith. Um, and um, what happens in the 15th century is you now have this whole other class of people who are, you know, they've got all these relatives. They're sort of the out Jews. There are the conversos. And the conversos are not finding, con ex you know, acceptance so easily in general Spanish society anymore. How many of them were actually practicing their Judaism in secret is a disputed matter. A large number of them probably just decided to conform. And what they, in effect, were doing was maybe some of the things they were doing were kind of like stuff they were just used to doing as Jews, right? Like they didn't like pork or something like that. But um, the fact is some of them were practicing their Judaism secretly, but the vast majority of them just tried to fit in. And so when the Spanish Inquisition started later in the, in the 15th, well, actually the Spanish Inquisition, although it got started in the 15th century, was extremely active in the following century when there were no out Jews living in Spain. By that point, many of the Converso families had been Catholics for a few generations in some cases. They, they, were, they were not Jewish in any way whatsoever, but they were in effect accused of, of being secret Jews. And this is when a lot of them started to try and leave the country and end up in communities elsewhere in the Mediterranean, Italy and the Ottoman Empire, where they then became Jews again. But they had been, in some cases, two or three generations of not being Jews. The conversos were largely ferreted out. To what degree did this... Someone was saying to me that 25% of the people in Spain have Jewish blood. Probably, yeah. Um, so obviously a lot of Jews stayed there, have reasonably converted covertly and remained. Yes, but, and, and they completely blended in. They gave up any aspect of their Jewish identity. And in some cases got into very high positions in both the church and the government. Um, 
So, and, and what you find is that in Spain, there begins to be the beginnings of what we call racial anti-Semitism, where it's not enough. In the Middle Ages, if you were a Jew and you converted to, to, to Christianity, you were completely accepted into the Christian community at that point. But in Spain, because there were so many large numbers of conversos in the late 14th century, and then again in 1490, when the Jews were expelled, there were a significant number of them ended up converting, okay, rather than leave. Uh, and some of them who fled to Portugal and then were forcibly converted to Christianity in Portugal. Um, what, you, what you find is, is that Christians in Spain are now making distinctions between what they called old Christians and new Christians, and the whole idea of blood, you know, racial distinctions yeah. began to arise. Limpieza de sangre. That was the expression. What was the expression? Limpieza de sangre. What does it mean? Cleanliness of the blood. Cleanliness of the blood. Purity of the blood. Okay. So you had these conversos who had been Catholic for several generations in the in the in the 16th and 17th century who were who were looked down upon by others because they were new Christians. Uh, and, and this, most scholars believe, is the beginning of racial anti-Semitism. I remember reading about a Catholic family who carried on the tradition in their family of lighting, going into the basement on Friday night and lighting candles. They didn't know why they did it. Exactly. It was a family tradition. Yes, there was a famous um, uh, Joachim uh, Prince, who was the rabbi of a congregation in uh, B'nai Abraham, originally in Newark and then in, in Livingston, wrote a book many, many years ago called The Secret Jews, and he relates a, a story that actually is from Toronto. Uh, when I was growing up, most of the Jewish community who had cleaning ladies, they were all from Portugal, okay? They mostly came from the Azores. There had been an immigration of, of, of Portuguese uh, people from the Azores, and um, it's like, you know, as my mother would put it, every one of her cleaning ladies was named Maria, you know what I mean? Anyway, so the point is, uh, the, uh, Prince relates a story of a Jewish woman who uh, had her cleaning lady over on, uh, who was Portuguese, had her cleaning lady over on Friday, and the, lady, and the person was around when the sun came down, and she saw the Jewish woman um, uh, lighting Shabbos candles, and she said, oh, we do that, but we do it in the basement. <laughs> and they had no idea. It was just a family custom by that point. So, yes, there were some who carried on these customs, often having no idea what they were, um, and... In effect, there were also, by the way, a number of these what are called crypto-Jews who emigrated to Mexico and from Mexico found their way into New Mexico and other Spanish territories. And in fact, um, there's, there was one rabbi from Oregon who had done a lot of work sort of ferreting out all of this stuff and actually connecting with a number of them who wanted to go back to being Jewish. There's a whole society of crypto Judaism in, in you know that this this rabbi started um, and um, it's quite fascinating because they were found in any place where there were Spanish uh, territories uh, partly because some of them decided it was better to go to the Americas and get away from Spain but then the Inquisition kind of <laughs> followed them but um, and so there you know some of them were caught but they kept trying to go to the margins which is why they ended up in New Mexico which was about as far as way as you could get <laughs> like right take through what's now called road scholars oh yeah in that area yeah and visit with families and so yeah and there they found people in parts of portugal who the you know whole town which is descendants of conversos and and so on and so forth um but anyway um so this is this is a fascinating case history where maimonides is living at a time where informing is a big problem in christian europe it's probably not as much of a problem in his in his community, and he, they don't have the power to do much about it, but he knows about what's going on in Spain because he came from Spain. He knows the Jewish community in Spain had the right of doing this from Islamic times, um, and so he mentions it, but he himself never got involved in any kind of case like this in, in Cairo. You know, there are no evidence that there were any kind of uh, capital uh, crimes uh, of informers in it, but in Spain, it's quite fascinating. When um, I was in graduate school, I actually wrote a paper on this where I tried to find the chart, how many mentions of it, and try to estimate the numbers. Um, unfortunately, when I was preparing this class, I couldn't find the paper. But um, uh, you know, I found at least about thirty cases of this over the centuries that uh, that were actually mentioned um, of, of executions, executions or mutilations of. 
Jewish informers. Yeah, of informers and others by the community, which of course is shocking on uh, was some level because people don't know about this and don't you know when you, when you read Jewish attitudes towards capital punishment, they tend to be um, you know fairly. They always talk about the the rabbinic. Uh, reluctance to put any people to death. There's famous statements by Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfon, um, but they don't often mention the fact that in places where the Jews were given the power, they f they felt they needed to exercise it, right? So the Jewish attitude towards capital punishment is is a complex question. It's not you know there's no liberal or conservative answer to this issue, because part of the problem mm -hmm. is is that in a case like, um, mm. I have no idea who this is. Um, um, okay. Uh, part of the problem is, is that when you're dealing with uh, Talmudic texts, for example, we have no idea what they were actually doing. In other words, uh, what kind of, was it all theoretical or not? We don't know much about how this was practiced in biblical times, for example. Uh, in other words, you there are cases of people being put to death, and there are numerous laws in the law codes of the Torah, which, you know, murder, it's not just for murder. There's a, there's a good number of things where you're supposed to be put to death for. We have no idea whether these things were actually ever carried out. Uh, and, and so it's a very complex question um, when if you were to say, does Judaism support capital punishment or not? I don't think you can make an answer yes or no. You know, that doesn't mean that a Jew today can't, on the basis of Jewish values, come to a question uh, of, say, being against capital punishment. I mean, you know, speaking for myself, I come to that conclusion personally for a whole variety of reasons, um, you know. But I can't, I will never unequivocally say Judaism, whatever that means, or have, have been against capital punishment, because that's just not true historically. These, these kinds of, ca of cases of capital punishment really do seem like they're in, this, in, in a kind of case of self-defense. Absolutely. And they don't seem as if they're punishment for a specific crime so much as we've got to stop this stuff from happening because it's ruinous. Well, yeah, I think, I think, I think uh, Asher Ben Yechiel's son basically put it correctly. I mean, again, I'm using a modern term, but in effect he said we're in a time of martial law where because, the, and given the fact this is the late 13th century when the situation in Spain legally and socially was beginning to decline, um, uh, they were under a very precarious situation and where something could just ignite a pogrom, right? And so that's why they felt that in order for the community to, and the Torah to survive, they had to take extraordinary measures. Was the Islamic control of Spain starting to be challenged? Oh, it was almost gone by then, you see. By 1250, there was only one Spanish, there was only one Islamic territory left, and that was Granada. And Granada was, you know, relatively small. The rest of Spain was uh, reconquered, re um, mostly under, I mean, there were several right. Spanish kingdoms, right. but, you know, by the, fifth, by, the, um, by the 15th century, there were essentially two Spanish kingdoms, uh, Aragon and Castile, and they ruled over all the other kingdoms like Leon and Valencia and all these places that had been separate territories. And as we know, in, you know, Isabel and Ferdinand, one Ferdinand was the king of Aragon and Isabel was the queen of Castile. They got married and they united Spain. And at the time, uh, Portugal was also under Spanish rule. Um, and one of the things they did in order to purify the state was to kick out the, Mus the remaining Muslims and Jews, right? So, um, you know, Spain was evolving towards becoming a purely Christian state, um, and you cannot uh, ignore the influence of actual Christianity. In other words, you can look at it for cynical reasons, but you can also say that Isabella and, Isabella and Ferdinand were seeing what they were doing as something they were doing because they were very, very pious. Now, one of the interesting things is that the impetus for kicking the Jews out of Spain was probably coming from Isabella, primarily. There was a there was a very famous rabbi at the time 
who was also a very high official in the, in the, in the government of Ferdinand and Aragon named Don Isaac Abravanel, who ended up leaving and going to Spain. And, and there was a biography many years ago written of Abravanel. He's an amazing character. Um, and he went to the king personally and was begging him to not do this. And in effect, Ferdinand told him, well, you know, Isabella wants this. Um, and um, he was the queen Esther of his uh, he he really he really did he really tried I mean he he we know this because he you know he wrote about it um, and he failed and he failed and he and he wrote about it later because there were, when the Jews were expelled from Spain this was a huge trauma because the Jews had been in Spain since Roman times and they viewed Spain you know as their homeland they they were indigenous people to that and what you found in the century following that. Um, even after the first generation of exiles died, um, some real, you know, uh, for the first time, you well, not for the first time, but you find real introspective um, discussions about why did this happen? And although there were some very traditional answers, it was all our own fault, we were sinners, there were some who actually used what we would call secular historical. In other words, one person, one, one person wrote the fact well, you know, we became moneylenders and we gathered a lot of this and we incurred the jealousy of the masses. And this is what caused our downfall. When you read the edict of expulsion, they were not allowed to take, you know, they could convert their property to money, but they were not allowed to take it out of the country. Yeah. So they, the government and other people greatly enriched themselves. And the Ottoman emperor at the time was amazed because he said, "Here, how come the king of Spain is um, is kicking out some of the most, you know, his best people out of the country?" The the Ottoman emperor, of course, because a lot of them ended up in the Ottoman Empire. He invited them, he invited he them to come, and a lot of them did. Um, and so this is where you have the beginnings of all of these Sephardic communities in places where there is an indigenous Jewish community and you find they continue to identify themselves as a community. So in Italy, for example, you have places where there was the original Italian Jews living with the, a group of Sephardic exiles and they often have their own synagogues and so on. This was true in Venice. In fact, in Venice there were, Ita there were Italian Jews, Ashkenazic Jews, and Sephardic Jews all living in uh, Venice. Um, and you find this in places like Salonika, for example, uh, was a big area for uh, Sephardic exiles, and so on and so forth. Okay, we will see you next week. You want to summarize with George and Sam what you started with? Yeah. Yes, um, we're going to be... Uh